President Buhari in Brussels, Belgium for the 6th European Union African Union Summit. There are not less than seven or eight foreign heads of state who have indicated their wish to meet President Mohamed Buhari. Huge interest in our own country. President Buhari transmits proposals for appropriation 2022 amendment to Senate. However, following the suspension of TMS subsidy removal, the 2022 budget framework has been revised to fully provide for TMS subsidy. Nigeria Meteorological Agency predicts early onset of raining season this year. Long length of growing season is anticipated in parts of Plateau, Kaduna, Edo, and of course Imo. And on Good Morning Nigeria today, we shall discuss the independence of state judiciary. Judgment uh, given by the Apex Court, that's the Supreme Court, regarding the Executive Order Number no. Ten, which spells out guidelines for the implementation of the independence of the state judiciary, as well as the legislature, has triggered another round of discourse in the nation's polity. Uh, no question about that, uh, uh, Claire. Uh, the, to some uh, persons, the judgment uh, was a surprise. And, of course, those uh, who were surprised by it include members of the Judiciary Staff Union of Nigeria, JUSUN, who went uh, on strike for months uh, due to non-implementation of the financial autonomy of uh, state judiciary. Now, six of the Supreme Court justices on the panel set aside Executive Order No. 10, describing it as unlawful and unconstitutional. Now, recall that the Executive Order 10 had mandated the Accountant General of the Federation to deduct from source amounts due to state legislatures as well as the judiciaries from the monthly allocation to each state for states that refuse to grant such autonomy. Now, the majority of the Supreme Court justices uh, who ruled to nullify Executive Order 10 adopted the expert opinion of uh, Musbawa Detumbi and Mahmoud Magaji, two of the senior advocates invited by the Apex Court to advise it on the matter. Now, the justices were emphatic that the president overstepped the limit of his constitutional authority by issuing such executive orders. Now, the only justice who dissented, that's uh, Justice Wani Abaji, held, and I quote, we are not unaware of the hanky-panky and uh, subterfuge played by state governors against the independence and financial autonomy of the state judiciaries. Now, it is a pitiable eyesore what judicial officers and staff go through financially at the hands of state executives who often flout constitutional and court orders to their whims and caprices. Thus, the pres Presidential Executive Order 10 is meant to facilitate the implementation of the constitutional provisions." Unquote. Well, as Nigerians continue to reflect on the Supreme Court uh, judgment, what are the implications of this decision to the independence of the state judiciary, considering the attitude of a number of state governors, as highlighted in the dissenting judgment. Now, how would the state governors be compelled, as it were, uh, to implement financial autonomy of the state judiciary? Also, bearing in mind the clear provisions in the Constitution, with particular reference to Section 121, subsection 3. So what are the sanctions in place for state governors that flout the constitutional provisions, you know, like the one concerning autonomy of state judiciaries? Which way forward or what uh, can be done uh, to, of course, uh, bridge the gap? This and more 
uh, the issues we will be taking up today on Good Morning Nigeria. I am Claire Dilabu Abdurazak. Always a pleasure to have you join us on the program, and we're live on the network service. And I'm Kingsley of Sadalo. I join my colleague Claire to also welcome you to, to this edition of the program. We're here in our Abuja headquarters studios, and in the course of the program, we have our usual complimentary segments, including business and newspaper review. Right now, here is Comfort Amodu, who has the highlights of the morning news. Good morning, Comfort. Good morning, Kinsley and Claire. Here's the morning news. President Mahmoud Bari is in Brussels ahead of the sixth EU African Union summit beginning on Thursday. And at the summit, the president is expected to join European and other African leaders to discuss issues of mutual concern. There are not less than seven or eight foreign heads of state who have indicated their wish to meet President Muhammadu Buhari. Huge interest in our own country. And it is, of course, to, to discuss matters of development for us, investment, weapons purchases and all of that. So we are hoping that there will be so much that uh, will take uh, from here. And the presence of uh, our leader, President Muhammad Buhari, is of greater significance. And it will help in, in a big, big way to push the national agenda of Nigeria at this meeting. And critical national issues, especially security of lives and property, dominated discussions as President Mahmoud Bari granted audience to the governors of Kogi and Imo states. The Deputy Senate President and Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives also came calling before he departed for Belgium. The President was very pleased, or is very pleased, about our performance in the state in the area of security, economy, infrastructure development, integration, peace and unity that are being enjoyed in Kogi State today. To make some requests that will assist us in ensuring that the security situation in Imo State is stable and that uh, the fight against bandit, banditry is also sustained. And contrary to the story making the rounds, the President Mahmoud Buhari ordered that a query be issued to the Chief Executive Office of the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority over the importation of adulterated fuel into the country. An authoritative source in the presidency says nothing of such ever happened. In a statement to this effect indicates that the earlier story by a national newspaper credited to an unnamed source has said an angry President Buhari, who doubles as Minister of Petroleum, directed the Minister of State, Timipri Silva, to issue a query to Farouk Ahmed, the regulatory boss. And the statement further said the President is aware that the Minister of State, the Chief Executive Officer of NNPC Limited, Mili Kiari, the NMGPRA head and everyone involved are working together to resolve the issues at the shortest possible time. And the statement says what is uppermost in the mind of the president is the restoration of smooth supply of quality petrol to Nigerians. And President Mahmoud Buhari has transmitted to Senate the 2022 Appropriations Act Amendment proposal in the letter, the president requested for an amendment of the 2022 Appropriations Act to address current realities in the nation. However, following the suspension of the PMS subsidy removal, the 2022 budget framework has been revised to fully provide for PMS subsidy an additional provision of 2.557 trillion naira will be required to fund the petroleum subsidy in 2022. And in other news, the Nigerian Meteorological Agency has predicted that the country will experience early onset of rainy season this year, beginning from February 28, 2022. Minister of Aviation Hadi Sirika released the compilation of the seasonal prediction on behalf of NIMET. Rainy season is anticipated in parts of Plateau, Kaduna, Edo, and of course Imo. 
and in health, 33 new cases of COVID-19 has been recorded in the last 24 hours and the latest figures released by the NCDC. Lagos State tops the chart with 30 new cases, followed by Kaduna State with nine cases. Delta and the FCT recorded five new cases each, while River State recorded a single case. Nigeria now has 254,124 confirmed cases of COVID-19, out of which 230,472 were treated and discharged, while 3,141 have died of the virus from the latest figures. And that's the news. Good morning, Nigeria. Continue shortly after this break with Kinsley. Right, welcome back. It's Good Morning, Nigeria, live on the network service. And uh, today we're looking at business news uh, in a moment. And um, uh, we understand that inflation has dropped to 15.6% uh, in the month of January 2022. Uh, of course, as against 15.63% uh, in the previous uh, month. And food inflation also decreases to 17.13%. Let's get all the details from our business news. Latest data by the National Bureau of Statistics shows that inflation declined marginally in January 2022 after demand pressure pushed prices in December 2021 with the Consumer Price Index, which measures inflation, increasing to 15.60% year-on-year in January 2022. The Statistician General of the Federation, Simon Harry, who released the figures, is optimistic that the numbers sustained would decline in the year. On the state-by-state -state comparison, all items inflation on year-on-year -year basis was highest in Abuja, the federal capital territory, with a figure of 18.5%. 9%, followed by Kogi, which had a figure of 18.28%, and Bauchi, 17.61%. On a month 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 basis, the food sub index increased to 1.62% in January this year, down by 0.57% points from 2.19% recorded in December 2021, and the urban inflation rate rising to 16.17% year-on-year in January 2022, from 17.03% recorded in the previous year, while the rural inflation rate increased to 15.06% in January 2022, from 15.92% in January 2021. Meanwhile, the World Bank has advised developing countries to focus on creating healthier financial sectors following the growing risks from financial fragility created by COVID-19 crisis and non-transparent debt. In its latest World Development Report, World Bank says finance for an equitable recovery risks may be hidden because the balance sheets of households, businesses, banks and governments are tightly interrelated as a result of high levels of non-performing loans which could reduce access to finance for low-income households and small businesses. Thank you very much, Comfort, for the business package. Up next for us is a new support review. Let me welcome Bayo Atayubi to do his usual newspaper review. Bayo, good morning. Good morning, Clegg. Good morning, Kinsley. Right, Bayo. Good morning, Let's Nigeria. See. Thank you. Uh, we have just two newspapers this morning. Let's take a look at the leadership. And starting from the midsection of the paper, uh, the lead story says, fuel scarcity bites harder amid NNPC assurance of one billion liters. Fuel scarcity bites harder amid NNPC's assurance of one billion liters. You have a number of riders to that headline. Motorists and commuters stranded. Keep vigil at filling stations. Transport fares rise as one liter sells for 600 naira in Abuja and Lagos black markets. Scarcity may last for another two weeks, uh, says Ipman. 
and president didn't order query of Nimitpra head, that is the midstream uh, and downstream petroleum regulatory authority, uh, and that's attributed to an official. The composite photographs there on the front page uh, show uh, the uh, queues at uh, some filling stations in Abuja, Kaduna, and Lagos yesterday. Now, uh, above uh, the headline there, of the, that's to say the late story, APC governors disagree on zoning of party chairmanship and other positions. FCTA, that's Federal Capital Territory Administration, uh, to borrow 200 billion naira for road and water projects. Five key, that's IED explodes in Borono. After ASU, Colleges of Education lecturers threaten strike. Claire. All right, uh, Kingsley, thank you. Let's look at uh, uh, midweek uh, Al Jazeera newspaper, and uh, it leads with supplementary budget. It says FG earmarks 2.55 trillion naira for fuel subsidy. And it comes with some riders. States LG is to cough up 1 trillion. Scarcity worsens PDP governor Taku Buhari. And the uh, other rider may affect inflation rate. Citizens' economy crunches. And NNPC assures of continuous supplies as black marketers make brisk business. That's the lead story. Um, just above that uh, lead story you find, uh, Abba Kiari faces extradition to U.S. Police deny shutting intelligence and special squads. Abba Kiari faces extradition to U.S. and police deny shutting intelligence and special squads. And uh, just uh, trending on the left-hand column there, FCTA refutes plan to demolish Senate President and speakers' residences. The details of that on page 10. And three Nigerian universities get WHO certification for vaccine production. It's also on page 10. And of course, in uh, sports, uh, that's uh, Afro basketball, D Tigress, that's Nigeria's D Tigress, to receive 25 million naira presidential cash reward. And of course, for qualifying and uh, beating the, the Mali in, in the finals. Let's look at the picture story. Uh, the picture story there, you find Vice President uh, Yemi Oshimbajo uh, being received by the Vice President of Liberia, Joel Taylor, at the Samuel Kion Stadium in Monrovia during the country's bicentennial celebration in Liberia on Monday. And to my right-hand column, that should be to your left, Oshun Guba, I regret Shola, can't determine my re-election. Oyetola, it's on page 28. And fresh crisis looms in APC over delay in sales of forms. And that is on page 27. That's the outlook of our midweek Al Jazeera. And uh, let's uh, throw the ball to Bayo Scott. Bayo, uh, let's begin with the fuel scarcity. Well, fuel scarcity, yes, it is still biting. But the situation uh, portends an improvement over what it was yesterday. This, the length of the queues are reducing. Mm -hmm. But yes, the length of the queues are reducing from what I saw yesterday and from what I saw uh, yesterday C and today. C certainly not, Bayer. Not, not, not if you're going to the MNK district. In mm -hmm. fact, all the the, the queues are. In, in fact, this morning as I was coming, as early as five, mm -hmm. you know. The petrol stations are locked, yet the queues are as long as you can imagine. And the black marketers are selling as, as you know, as much as 7,000 naira, yes, per 10 liters. That's well, about 700 naira per liter. That's one perspective. The perspective I saw is that from what I saw yesterday and compared to today, the queues are reducing. And there are more filling stations now that are opened compared to what it was yesterday. Well, be that as it may, let's look at uh, the development at National Assembly, where yesterday uh, there was a presidential proposal to the two chambers of the National Assembly over an amendment to the 2022 Appropriation Act. The Senate president as plenary read the correspondent uh, of the pres Mr. President seeking to provide for 106.161 billion naira for capital and 43. Point 87 billion for recurrent expenditure. The president said that the supplementary budget became necessary to restore key projects uh, slashed by the National Assembly. The total budgets that were slashed amounted to about uh, 139 projects, 
with a value of about 13.24 billion. The president also sought for 2.557 trillion to fund the subsidy uh, in the 2022 appropriation year to cover the whole of the year. In the communication, the president also uh, sought transfer of the National Assembly expenditure amount of 16.59 billion from the service wide vote to the National Assembly statutory transfer. The president says this is in respect of separation of powers so that and the financial autonomy of the National Assembly. The president says he gave the indication at the, of this amendment before he signed the 2022 appropriation bill. Meanwhile, the president arrived in Brussels yeah, to participate. Before, yeah, those stories, uh, we, also, we took some of them in our bulletin earlier. Uh, the issue of uh, the supplementary uh, appropriation submitted by the president to the National Assembly is interesting. Uh, it means that uh, for the rest of 2022, uh, fuel subsidy will remain. That is, if the National Assembly approves uh, the appropriation proposal as submitted by the President. Yes. So, uh, we then might be looking at 2023 as the uh, target year for the removal of subsidy. Although, we should also point out that the Honorable Minister of State for Petroleum, to be perceived, I was our guest on Good Morning Nigeria a couple of weeks ago, and he did say that there were a number of milestones that the government was targeting, including, of course, the rehabilitation of the refineries, uh, as well as the coming on stream of the Dangote refinery, that if this uh, milestone is kicking, uh, and then we have domestic supply, then, of course, uh, subsidy will, could be removed uh, at a much earlier date than the period probably to be covered by the appropriation uh, uh, supplementary uh, bill that the president has now forwarded. Well, um, when the refurbished refineries come midstream and Dangote refinery also come in midstream, the tendency is that uh, the idea of importing petrol will completely be eliminated. But it does not necessarily transfer to bottom rate price for petrol because Dangote refinery will be getting crude oil at world market price. And if that is the case, it means you'll be getting selling, buying your petrol at the current market price then. Well, so, I, I read probably uh, a day or two ago that the Dangote refinery would get its uh, crude oil at uh, a narrow rate rather than uh, international exchange, which would be, of course, the dollar. That the NNPC or its agents would sell to Dangote refinery at the narrow, at, not at uh, the U.S. dollar. Oh, that's, wow, yes. that's, that's, that's great. A, that's, a, that's what that's I read, yes, yes. But the, the, the story about fierce, uh, fierce scarcity biting harder, I'm just curious. Let's, let's take a look at it, because sometimes uh, we impose hardships on ourselves uh, that are unnecessary. unnecessary. So, Bayo, if you recall, it was only last week, early last week, we started discussing to say, look, fear stations were shot in, in uh, the different parts of the Federal Capital Territory, and we were wondering what was happening. Was it in anticipation of the removal of fear subsidy or oh, what? Okay. Until it became clear by Tuesday uh, when it was announced that, look, there was some contaminated fuel uh, cargoes. Uh, there, there were some ca cargoes mm -hmm. of contaminated fuel that came in, uh, and they needed to, to deal with that. NNPC often says that we have at least 28 days of uh, fuel stock available. Does it mean that the contaminated cargoes, both the ones that had arrived and the ones that were on the high seas, were the only stock that we were expecting? Does it also mean that the cargoes that were discharged contaminated all storage facilities such that you don't have any other storage facility that could be available? If you go to a filling station, for instance, I mean, they have many tanks. They have, they have many tanks. Have they been able to isolate the ones where they dumped the, uh, uh, the toxic cargo? So that why, how come all of a sudden, in the last uh, few days or so, the queues all over the place? Assuming we didn't have uh, this uh, contaminated cargo, would we have been short of fuel supply? Well, uh, the positive indication is that some stations were shut, not because they were holding petrol in anticipation of increase in pump price, but because they had actually been supplied contaminated fuel. So they were waiting for those fuel to be evacuated. Now that some of them have achieved that, I think the fresh supplies uh, uh, 
increased by the NNPC how, how do, have how now do, How do you explain the fact that at the black market, mm. you know, they have ready supply, they have supplies and they are selling? That is the curious question. Where do those <laughs> boys who sell in Jerichas get their supply? Bios. When several times it has been announced that it is illegal to sell petrol on the street in Jerichas. So, well, which, which, is, uh, which is why I was raising the issue of the tanks that they have, the fuel tanks. If a filling station, unless it's a small filling station, usually has uh, more than one Two, underground three, tank, four several, or to feed the pumps yes. that they have. So does it mean that uh, the cargoes are right? Because at some point we were told that the cargoes were deposited uh, in, in Lagos and Southwest area and that those that were coming up north uh, were recalled. So w when did the contaminated fuel get to other parts and into all the uh, storage, uh, into, into the tanks that now, you know, filling stations are all closed? Claire, it's an important question. Those who are selling by the roadside, where are they getting their fuel supplies from? I, I don't know. It's, it's I, I did a little investigation yesterday, and, one, and you know, one of them, a woman, said she, she gets up as early as 2.30 to go to the filling stations to and purchase. Which yes. is the sell yes. in the... Precisely. Deep time of the night. Yeah. Well, they, 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 I, I'm sorry, I'm being asked, bio, yes. There's some dangerous thing that is probably playing out in Ocean State. And I'm sure you have heard the stories. We also, Claire also read that story from mm. the paper that she has. Uh, it has to do with the supremacy of who becomes uh, the uh, governor mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the next election. Arek Beshola is up in arms against the incumbent. Uh, he has his own candidate. And, uh, of course, uh, the uh, incumbent is said to be uh, the cousin of, of a godfather. And so each party is saying no man is God, that nobody can play God. And I just want to remind them that they are probably coming 15 years uh, late uh, into the game because in Edo State, that slogan was on for a long time that no man is God. Mm -hmm. And that was to deal with political godfatherism. Uh, and they said they killed godfatherism and they tried to resur resurrect godfatherism. God godfatherism. <laughs> All right, gentlemen, Bayo and uh, Kingsley, thank you. Thank you, Bayo. Again, we appreciate you thank always. You. And um, do have a pleasant day. And um, stress free from fuel, uh, search of fuel. Thank you. <laughs> All right, this is Good Morning Nigeria live on the network service. And today we'll be looking at uh, the uh, autonomy of the judiciary and the legislature at the state level vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Supreme Court's decision. Just in a moment, and uh, you can still be part of our conversation uh, if you, of course, uh, you know, tweet us. You're watching Good Morning Nigeria live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. Now, as a prompt for our conversation, which is on the independence of state judiciary. Let's listen into this background up put together by our correspondent, Ekene Undului. The judiciary, popularly referred to as the last hope of the common man, is seen as the guidance and protector of fundamental human rights in any democracy. To ensure that this arm of government performs its functions efficiently and impartially, the principle of separation of powers is adopted by democracies across the world. In Nigeria, separation of powers is provided by the 1999 Constitution. But despite this provision, the judiciary at the state level still remains as an appendage of the executive arm of government. Many believe that the absence of financial autonomy for the judiciary at state level makes it difficult for some judges to be impartial in handling cases that involve the executive as the governors determine their finance. In order to ensure financial autonomy of the judiciary and legislature, President Muhammad Buhari in May 2020 signed the Executive Order 10 to give effect to the provision of the 1999 Constitution. The President's decision was met with commendations, especially from the judiciary but state governors expressed concerns over its constitutionality. To effect the implementation of this provision of the Constitution was why the Judicial Staff Union of Nigeria embarked on an industrial action last year that lasted for over two months, grinding to a halt all judicial processes and leaving litigants with nowhere to go. The impasse was resolved with an understanding 
that implementation of financial autonomy will commence at the state level. Expectations of state judicial workers have however been cut short, as just on Friday last week, in a split decision of six justices to one, the Supreme Court in Abuja nullified Executive Order 10 in the suit filed by 36 states through their attorneys general. The Apex Court held that Executive Order 10 was inconsistent with the 1999 Constitution and therefore unconstitutional, illegal, null and void and of no effect whatsoever. What does this portend for Nigeria's judiciary at the state level? Guests on Good Morning Nigeria shall be speaking to the issues in a moment. All right. Thank you very much, Ekene uh, Ndule. Once again, let me remind you that you can be part of our conversation by using our Twitter handle at NTAGMN. And our discussion today is on the autonomy of the judiciary and the legislature. And we're looking at it against the background of the Supreme Court's decision just a few days ago, yesterday rather. So let me quickly introduce our guests who are already seated here in the studio. Let me begin with uh, a professor of law and former governor of Edo State, His Excellency, uh, Professor Osereme Osumbo. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. All right. Uh, we also have here with us in the studio uh, Mr. Ted Temba, Damien Agbe, who is Principal, State Council, Department of Civil Appeals, Federal Ministry of Justice. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. It's my All pleasure. Right. All right. We also have joining us from our Cardinal studio, Yunus Ustans Usman, a senior advocate of Nigeria, San, and of course, a legal practitioner. We're glad to have you join us on the program. Ernest Ujuku, who is the uh, is a senior advocate of Nigeria, and of course uh, is uh, joining us for this conversation. And I hear he's a pioneer head Nigerian law school in Ugu. Thank you very much for joining us. All right, can sleep. Uh, all right, uh, gentlemen. Once again, our pleasure uh, to have you join us uh, for this conversation. Uh, principal focus is on the independence of the state judiciary. Uh, we do recall that last Friday, the Supreme Court, uh, six to one, there was a full panel of the Supreme Court uh, struck down executive order number 10, which was issued in May uh, of 2021 by President Muhammadu Buhari as a way of uh, giving the facilitation, as it were, to the explicit provisions of the 1999 Constitution as amended. We're going to start off uh, with uh, just having to understand what the elements of uh, independence are of, of a judiciary. When we say that a judiciary is, uh, is autonomous or is independent, exactly uh, what do we mean? We'll begin with uh, uh, Professor uh, Osumbo, Professor of Law, former Governor of Edo State, uh, former Senator of the Federal Republic, and in fact, uh, he was also chairman of the Senate Committee on the Judiciary. Professor Osumbo, what are the elements of judicial uh, independence? Well, first of all, um, there is the separation of powers, which uh, uh, we have under our constitution. And the reason why we have the concept of separation of powers is that one arm of government should not um, ride roughshod over the other. Uh, and that unless you separate these powers, there is the tendency for people to lapse into uh, despotism and tyranny and dictatorship. So there are checks and balances. Although this is not watertight, you know, each of these three arms is not, uh, does not sit as an island of its own. There are interrelationships, but by and large, they are meant to be separate. The other issue is the concept of the rule of law. Civilized societies operate in accordance with the rule of law rather than the rule of man. And it is the responsibility of the judiciary essentially to keep the other 
uh, arms of government in check by ensuring that they uphold the rule of law. And they do this by interpreting the laws, giving life to the laws that have been passed by the legislature and assented to by the executive. In order for them to be able to play this role properly, you have to guarantee their independence. And this constitution of 1999 has more than the previous constitutions that we had set out to guarantee the independence of the judiciary. Uh, because by so doing, you'll be able to strengthen them. Uh, the executive cannot, for instance, use disbursements of funds as a means of forcing the hands of the judiciary. And also in terms of appointment, uh, dismissal, uh, under the 1999 Constitution, the tenure of judges is more secure than it used to be. You will recall that in the Second Republic, as, as late as the Second Republic, it was common for state governors just to go on television and announce the dismissal, the sack of a judge. Uh, but we didn't have the NJC as it is now. NJC, you must pass the appointment and dismissal of judges. Judicial officers must pass through the NGC as a means of guaranteeing that judges don't operate under fear of sanction by the executive for a decision which they have taken, which may not be to the liking of the chief executive of the state. So now coming to the issue of financial independence, because you cannot talk of independence of the judiciary if you cannot guarantee their financial independence. If the head of court or the head of the judiciary has to be going to, in the case of the federal, going to the villa to beg for funds, or in the case of states, going to meet the state governors to beg for funds, then that already puts the independence of the judiciary, the impartiality of the judiciary in peril. Uh, because there's quid pro quo. You know, he who pays the piper dictates the tune. So if the chief executive, whether the president at the federal level or the governor at the state level, is paying the piper, paying the judge, then you would expect that uh, there, may be, there may be a tendency for them to uh, interfere with the impartiality and independence of the judiciary. So mm -hmm. that is really uh, the reason why uh, there is this independence. But despite the provisions that have been made in the Constitution, as I said, 1999 Constitution, well thought out uh, provisions, we find that this <coughs> ideal situation that was envisaged did not happen, which is why there had been clamor uh, for some kind of intervention. I saw it myself as chairman of the Senate Committee on Judiciary that something needed to be done to ensure that there is financial independence uh, on the part of the judiciary. They do not go cap in hands begging for the release of their funds. And uh, it is this clamor, I believe, that led to the president issuing this executive order number 10, which was the subject of the Supreme Court judgment last Friday. Okay. It's an attempt to, to solve a problem which now that executive order number 10 has been uh, nullified, declared on law and on constitution. The challenge still remains. How do we cure the evil that it was meant to Okay, okay. Uh, th th thank you, Prof. I, I think uh, we would like to exhaust the question that Kinsley has raised, you know, just to provide a kind of template for us to, to move forward. And I just, before we come to the studio, let's uh, utilize the opportunity of the Zoom uh, before we, we begin to have our, our issues with it. Professor Ernest Ojuku is joining us via Zoom. At, at what point then, uh, Professor Osumbo here has given us, you know, an explanation of what it is, you know, to, to have autonomy, especially for, for the arms of, of government, the legislature and the judiciary. But at what point do they correlate at the state level? The judiciary and the yes. executive, or what? yes, the judiciary, the legislature at the state level, and the state government at that level. Well, there, 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 there are different checks and balances as uh, espoused by my colleague. Uh, one, of course, 
the uh, the person that that will appoint the, the 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 judges at the state level is the governor after a recommendation by the national judicial council uh, for the position of the chief judge uh, the governor will have to take take it a step further to the legislature of the state to approve that appointment so uh that, that's some kind of uh, check uh the, there's there's also uh, a judicial service commission at the state uh, that has um, some members who are appointed by the executive of, of, the, of the state. Um, yeah, the 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 uh, uh, the process of uh, discipline is all about the same thing. On the recommendation of the National Judicial Council, it is the governor that will remove, if um, they have been asked to do so, a, a, a judge. Uh, in the case of a state uh, um, chief judge, he has to also go a step further by getting that approval into the legislative um, uh, uh, arena for them to also give their own consent. So there's that, a few of those kind of things are uh, constitute the checks and balances between the arms of government in the state. Mm. Uh, all right, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Ojuku for your uh, opening comments. Let's also go back to our Kaduna Network Center. We are the senior advocate, uh, Yunus Stars was earlier introduced. Uh, uh, let's senior advocate, let, let's also have your take on uh, what the independence of, of the judiciary uh, ought uh, uh, to mean. Uh, Professor Osumbo has given some elaborate ex explanation, but in practice, uh, what, what do we find? You see, I totally agree with my learned brother, Silk, uh, Professor uh, Osumbo. But in practice, it is a totally different ball game, particularly at the state level. Let me tell you, let nobody hide from it. At the federal level, you have this autonomy. But at the state level, it is the exact opposite of what the provisions of the Constitution are meant to serve. The state judiciaries are strictly under the control of the governors. There is no state, to my little experience so far, about 40 something years, that is not totally under the control, the state judiciary that is not totally under the control of the state governors. And you know how they do it? Now, despite the provisions of section 81, subsections 1 and 2, uh, 162.9, 121 that says the uh, financial autonomy of the of the judiciaries are guaranteed and that all the money is meant for them to be given to them unfortunately unfortunately the uh, national judicial council that is supposed to disburse this money directly to the heads of courts direct them to the governors and the governors in order to coerce and control the judiciary in the states keep this money even where they are supposed to pay them en block pay them in such a way that that uh, the heads of court must continue to come and beg them for anything and the moment that happens that independence is gone and that is where we are up to today. So the, the, uh, I think our main focus today will be how do we get out of this problem? And may, may, may I just, if, if I'm not talking too much, may, may I just tell you, the only way we can get out of it, the only way is that, look, let these monies be disbursed directly by the National Judicial Council to the heads of courts directly, not through the governors. Somebody said, I did the paper uh, in, in, in Ghana on the independence of the judiciary. They have something uh, like our own. But, but they didn't have this problem. And, and they told me, they say, what happens is that the, the governors do not even know when the monies come. But here, our governors monitor them. And uh, uh, all, uh, they, are, they always make sure that the monies come through them. So this is the problem we, we, we have. Some other person, a colleague said, ah, what about section 162, subsection 9, that says uh, it should be paid to the states? No, it says it should be paid to the heads of courts at the federal level, 
and states. States there means heads of courts at the state level, not the state governors. But the governors are misinterpreting that to coerce the Federal Judicial Council to give them uh, this money, say, give us, we'll give to them. Th that, that is not the construction of that provision. And it is most unfortunate. Up till now, up till now, I am telling you, there is no state judge that, seriously speaking, is not afraid of, uh, of the powers of the governor. And that is most unfortunate. That robs the, this independence we are talking of from our hands totally. And on, unless something is done, and how that thing is done is that, look, all the states will do, give us the names of your judges and, and, uh, and the allowances. Then there are capital projections. Give it to the uh, NJC so that NJC will give it to them directly. Do you know one of the ways the governors do it? They say, okay, let's see how they will do it. They don't have the list of the judges. They don't have how much the allowances and uh, other emoluments are. They don't know their capital uh, expenditure. So that you'll be forced to say, okay, since we don't know it at the federal level, you, we will give it to you uh, who know it at the state level. And, and that is where they, they, they filter with these funds. It is most unfortunate, and I am telling you, I'm, I'm telling you, let, let these governors know one thing. What you do to somebody's child today will be done to your child tomorrow, whether you like it or not. Hmm. Okay, we are back to the studio. Let's also hear from um, uh, Temba Damian Agbe, who is the Principal Counsel, Department of Civil Appeals. Thank you very much. Well, uh, independence of the judiciary under the Constitution is guaranteed. Practically, it is, however, different, as already alluded to by my learned senior. So, however, I think. Uh, Apart from financial independence, especially what I think the problem of Nigerian judiciary is, is the appointment process. When you look at the appointment process, it vested a lot on the governors. Recommendation, why not? If there was a process, a mechanism, that the appointment be made by the NJC once that lawyer is qualified <coughs> to take that position. Would have, it would have been a different case altogether. However, the appointment is still lies on the governor. What the only thing the NJC does is to recommend. Recommendation is not a command. If you recommend and don't appoint, there is no way that person will become a judicial officer. Now we come to the financial aspect of it. We look at the constitutional <coughs> provisions, they are so beautiful but they are obeyed in breach rather than in obedience. And I think until the judiciary are given that financial, anyway, I, I can see that the constitution has tried in a way because the salaries of the judicial officers does not come from the consolidated revenue fund of the state under section two, uh, 121, 120 or 121. It comes, <coughs> Sorry, you can Sorry. have yeah. water. It comes from the Consolidated Revenue Fund of the Federation. Mm. Okay, so wh while he's having a cup of water, Kingsley, I think would you... No, 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 it's, that's him, it's, it's oh, making okay. a point. So it comes from the, the Consolidated Revenue of the Federation. So in a way, their salaries and other allowances are not delayed. The basic problem of the judiciary when it comes to funding is the capital project, which ought to have come from the Consolidated Revenue Fund of the state, that is state judiciary. Their salaries are guaranteed by the Constitution. So in a way, if not for capital project, the Constitution has taken care of their other welfare. So a judicial officer cannot be afraid of the state governor for his own personal emolument. However, for the development of the judiciary in that state, he may Absolutely. likely, yes, to bend to the, the governor of the state. So there must be a way out. So are we still blaming the governors? Because uh, uh, the senior Leonard Sick uh, from Kaduna, uh, you know, is giving us an, you know, painting a picture of, um, you know, total blame on the governors. It's, it's a constitutional, you know, uh, gap, sort of. Yes, the Constitution 
has made provisions for the charge. This particular money should be charged on this account without a procedure. Without a procedure. Once there is an <coughs> appropriation bill or law of the state, definitely the money for the judiciary, the funds meant for the judiciary is determined. By, the, by that constitutional provision, that money ought to have been paid directly to the head of that court, of that state. Unlike the other monies under Section 81 are paid to the head, to the NJC for distribution to the head of court established pursuant to Section 6. So that, that, that in that particular category, the only fund captured for the state, for the state judiciary is the remuneration of the judicial officers. And judicial officers here means the chief judge, judges of the state high court, and the high court judge, uh, judges, the cautionary courts of appeal judges, and then the Sharia court of appeal judges. It's not for the, the chief registrar of that court. He's not a judicial officer. So he cannot benefit from the consolidated revenue fund of the federation. It is only the judicial officers that are. So I said to an extent, the, their financial autonomy for their remuneration has been guaranteed by the Constitution. And the federal government is actually doing a perfect job on that particular aspect. There's, there's no complaint as into the remuneration of judges and justices. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Damian. Uh, we, uh, we will get into the nitty gritty of, of uh, of these provisions and then the actual practice. One of the comments you, you made has to do with uh, the challenge of appointment yes, of, of judicial officers. That's to say judges and ultimately the chief judges uh, of, uh, of, of a state. Uh, is this still a challenge? Because from time to time, at least you will see the advertisements now for applications for persons who are interested in becoming judges, at least on various platforms. I mean, you do, uh, you know, your mates will circulate that for persons who are, who are interested. Now, uh, they, it is for the NJC, once the shortlist comes out, the shortlist goes to uh, the NJC, the NJC then makes a recommendation. The governor doesn't have powers uh, to appoint outside of uh, the names that have been recommended. Yes, I will give you two instances in Nigeria. We have the, the instance of River State. I think the case that was Agumogo, there was a particular judge that was the most senior. I think one was picked from the cautionary court of appeal to be appointed the chief judge of that state as against the usual practice. And then the, river, the cross river issue came up. NJC recommended the female uh, judge, I've uh, forgotten her name. But she is the current uh, chief judge of uh, Cross River State. It took over <laughs> six months, I believe. It took intervention from even the MBA from before the person that was qualified and recommended by the NJC was appointed. So even though we said that it is a recommendation that the, there has, the governors still try to exercise their powers. And then in the case of appointment of judges, especially. Well, it's practically, we may not have evidence to show that sometimes you don't even know the criteria for qualification. You don't know the criteria. Lawyers apply. A lawyer of 20, 10, 15 post score has applied. A lawyer of 10 post score has applied. And a lawyer of 10 post score that has handled cases up to the Supreme Court is contesting with a lawyer that is just a level post court that has never appeared even before the Supreme Court. Maybe from his a court to bar, he was appointed a magistrate. I'm not saying he's not qualified or she's not qualified. Once you are 10 years at the bar, you are qualified to be appointed a judge of the high court. I'm not saying the person is not. But in practical, let us look at a lawyer that was called to bar and secured a bank job and has been working in a bank for the past 10 years. And then a lawyer that was in court after he was called to bar, up to 15 years, standing side by side, to my mind, 
I may be wrong, but the lawyer that has been in court all this while should be more qualified in my mind than a lawyer that has been in the bank set, banking sector for 10 years or 11 years without appearing before a judge or taking evidence or even addressing the court on the, pro the evaluation of evidence. So in, a, in any way, we may, on a practical basis, or official basis, we look at it and we say, oh, they have the, the appointment is not flawed. But if we look deep into it, I think we still have an issue because these people are just recommended. Sometimes the recommendation, they are, they are just recommended and the, 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 the governor has the right not to appoint at that particular time. I've seen it. That's, that's <coughs> why I asked the question, Kinsley, if there was a gap. And just as you have explained now, and, and, and my question was, you know, uh, uh, in relation to the appointment of, you know, judicial officers. Kiste, you are, you could ask, ask your question. No, no, I, <laughs> yeah, I, because I, I was to ask, just to uh, <laughs> probably provide one other example of uh, the exercise of uh, powers by the governor. Again, in River State, uh, this happened last year. Yes. Uh, they appoint uh, a, a new chief judge. The most senior judge, uh, Justice Akbogunu, uh, was bypassed. And uh, I think the second or third uh, was then uh, uh, proposed and the name forwarded uh, for uh, recommendation and ultimately got appointed. So that's, that happened in River State last year. Justice yes. Akbogunu is a live issue. Uh, uh, she was bypassed once again. I'm just wondering, uh, Professor Osumbo, it, let, let's look at some of these uh, aspects of, of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, six to one, the Supreme Court says, look, executive order 10 is dead. The argument by uh, the Attorney General of the Federation was to say, look, the purpose of executive order 10 was not intended as a, a usurpation of powers or overstep of executive powers, but to give effect to the provisions of the Constitution, with particular reference, for instance, to the financial autonomy. It says section 121, uh, subsection 3, already guarantees that whatever credit is due to the judiciary in the consolidated revenue of a state should be handed over to the head of the judiciary in that state which in practice we are not uh, seeing. So, in your opinion, the, the, the majority, uh, the judges, uh, justices in this case, uh, did they fully, uh, uh, and with greater respect, advise their minds to the breach, extant breach, of that provision of the Constitution, which Executive Order 10 sought to cure? Well, Kingsley, uh, I think I mentioned just in passing during my introductory remarks that the major challenge facing us as a country is how to make people conform with the Constitution. That is a basic thing. As uh, my colleague here and as others have said, the Constitution has tried its best as much as you can to ensure that things are done properly. But the human beings <laughs> implementing the Constitution have failed or refused to follow the letter and spirit of the Constitution, which is why we have gotten ourselves to this situation. I hope there will be time for me to speak on the dissenting judgment, That's right. which raised very pertinent issues, and we must not run from those issues that were raised in the dissenting judgment. But the decision of the Supreme Court is the majority judgment. The majority judgment itself cannot be faulted. I agree perfectly uh, with, with the decision. In order to be able to understand the decision of the majority, which is the decision of the Supreme Court, you have to look at what Executive Order 10 actually says. What did it provide for? Because it is what it said that the Supreme Court was interpreting and deciding. Because state governments are not complying with the provision of section 121 subsection 3, I'm sure that people advise Mr. President that you will have to intervene in this issue, which was what gave rise to executive number 10, directing 
it's an it's a directive. Presidential order is a direct it's, it's a executive order is a directive from the president to the state governments that the money uh, in the consolidated revenue fund of the state or monies accruing to the state judiciary from the NJC must be credited to the heads of courts and the legislature. And that the state got, they must set up an implementation committee, a state implementation committee to ensure the disbursement of these funds. There will also be a presidential implementation committee that will go around states to ensure that the proper thing is being done. Kingsley, you will agree with me that this is the federal government wanting to supervise <laughs> and mm -hmm. check how a state manages its finances, which boils down to the question of true federalism. People have been mm -hmm. talking of, let us really, we say we're a federal system of government. Let us operate as a federal system of government. If we're a federation, the federal government cannot be managing its own finances and also managing and directing as to how state finances are to be utilized. That would be contrary to the spirit of federalism. So the executive order was an attempt to encroach on the federal system of government by the president issuing directives as to how states will manage its own finances. In this case, finances that are meant for the judiciary. Because, as, as they said, we, are, we operate a federal system. We operate a constitution, and every arm of government, every official must conform with the provisions of the constitution. So even though I believe that the, even the minority judge, the judge, he understands all these principles about separation of powers and federalism, but he felt that something has to be done to compel state actors to abide by these well-intended provisions of the Constitution. And why we have gotten ourselves in this situation, in this case, is that governors are actually very powerful, as has been said. And I also endorse the point which was made. And I am aware, when I was in the uh, chairman of Senate committee, a case was brought to my attention where <coughs> the governor of a state decided to appoint number seven the seventh, you were talking of number three, number seven in the order hierarchy. of hierarchy. And the matter was brought to my attention. I also took it up with them at the NJC, and they said they are, they are looking into the matter. The next thing I had is that number seven judge had been appointed chief and judge. confirmed as chief judge of that state. I then went back and asked, ah, but you sir, told me that this thing was receiving attention. They said, well, what could we do? The governor insisted that that is what he wanted to do, what could we do? So you find a situation where, despite the provisions of the Constitution empowering NJC in terms of appointment of judges, at a point, the NJC at a point can become helpless, and they will say, what else, what could we do? Throw their arms in the air. That is the sad situation that we have found ourselves, and the judgment of justice uh, of Abba Aji GSC has challenged us to really re reflect and see how we can overcome some of these problems. Again, uh, in the area of appointment, which, which you asked, there is the State Judicial Service Commission. It's not just NJC. The nominees have to be screened for judicial appointment by the State Judicial Service Commission. Yes. So, and it is the, uh, the state governor that appoints people. He constitutes uh, <laughs> more or less the, the, the state judicial service commission. We also have at the federal level the federal judicial service. That is the first clearing house before it even gets to the NJC and the president or gets to the uh, governor, the NJC in the case of the states. So the governors exercise a great deal of influence both through this well-established uh, line understood by the Constitution and other lines not envisaged by the Constitution, which I alluded to. But to quickly uh, just put some other issue in perspective, particularly the aspect raised by uh, uh, Ustaz SAN, my colleague from Kaduna, is that um, when the, the Section 84 provides that the remuneration 
that is salaries and allowances of certain categories of people that are enumerated must be drawn from the consolidated revenue fund and must not be altered to the detriment of holders of those offices. And they, they are listed, includes the president, the vice president, governor, then uh, uh, judges, justices of the Supreme Court, chief justice of Nigeria, chief justice of the, uh, chief judge of the state, customary court of appeal, and so forth and so on, up to uh, uh, Sharia, Grand Cadi and Sharia, and so forth and so on. So in appropriation, when the National Assembly does its appropriation, they appropriate from the consolidated revenue fund the salaries and emoluments of state judicial officers, which is what has been happening. But this case, don't forget that the 36 state judges also challenged the federal government and sought an order of the Supreme Court for federal government to take over their capital. That's right. So are we really operating the federal system? State governors want the state high court judges, their salaries, remunerations, emoluments are being paid by the federal government, and then you want the capital to be paid by the federal government. But yet, you will be the one appointing them. And all the res financial responsibility will be borne by the federal government. That is, uh, that is an anomaly okay, under a federal let, system let, let, of government. Let's pause you and also <laughs> bring in again, we go uh, to Professor Ernest Tojuku, who is joining us via Zoom. Uh, Prof, I, I'm, I, I, I don't know. It's all, um, I'm, I'm getting too confused in all of this. You know, on one hand, we put the state governors in a box and, 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 and box them, you know. On the other hand, we close our eyes to the real issues that present the loophole for the governors. Now, you're asking uh, that the monies or the funds meant for the judiciary and the legislature be given to them first line charge. The state governors are also to, you know, be responsible for the capital projects. Where do they get the funds to do that? If you give the legislature and the uh, judiciaries their funds at first line charge, would they also be responsible for executing their own capital projects? Uh, you're echoing a lot. If, if you can repeat the question exactly, let me know exactly what you asked. If, <coughs> if the uh, judiciary and the legislature get their first line charge funds as, you know, has been um, directed, uh, Will they also be responsible in executing their own capital projects rather than asking the state governor to also bear that burden? Yes, I mean, it's, a, it's clearly the issue of uh, federalism now. If you are, if you are a state, you are, uh, you are, you are autonomous. Uh, um, you, you, you wake up in the morning and sleep at night as a state. So you generate your own funds, you manage your own economy. That's how states are for, function in federal government. And that is the basis of uh, the demarcation. Now, the, the reason for the uh, budgeting by the federal government on the, for the remuneration of certain judicial officers named in the Constitution is based on the, our history of, of, uh, of uh, judicial autonomy. And so uh, at the time of transiting to a civilian regime in 1999, uh, um, our experience showed that, look, we need to protect these judges. That's why the, 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 the constitutional drafters uh, wrestled at least the remuneration of judges from the state. Uh, it's not that it's the ID thing. It was supposed to be paid by the state. But because of uh, our history, they decided, look, let's take this part. Be sure that judges at least get their salaries. And then the NJC, of course, also um, um, made sure that impl at implemented it, they put it in their own budget. And so uh, there'd be no question about who had the duty to take over the remuneration of judges. That's the protection of the history of the country. So basically, it's supposed to be state. Now, I, I, it's also uh, good to mention that apart from the capital that the states are supposed to fund, uh, the states are also supposed to fund some other recurrent expenditures for the judiciary. It's not the uh, only salary has been taken out from them. So the, the maintenance of the, of the environment is, is under them. Uh, the provision of, of uh, vehicles and all those sort of things, they're supposed to deal with it. Uh, uh, and even the pension and gratuity is not, it's, it's handled by them too. 
a, a chunk of it. So, and these things is the the the, 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 it's supposed to come under the economy of the state. You, you shouldn't take it away from them. Now, the problem now is that the states actually provide these funds in some in some cases, but they, they but they provide it as as gifts. That's the major problem. Use it as the rope to hang on the neck of the necks of the judges or the judiciary in the state and control them like slaves. There's a total connection between that financial autonomy which the governors have refused to implement, and the independence of the judiciary, even in respect of appointment of judges. Uh, the question was asked earlier, how, uh, was it, how, do we, uh, how do, does the state governors control the uh, appointment of judges? L let me tell you the real thing. Uh, it's not the theory. Apart from one or two governors who are decent, because that has to do with human beings I was talking about, majority of the governors have learned over the years uh, how to control the judiciary through their funding mechanism. But even as much as uh, um, the courts going to, uh, observing their new legal year ceremonies, they have to run around governors begging them for two million or three million or five million naira for them to do it. And that's why many states don't uh, hold their new legal year ceremonies at the new legal year. Sometimes it takes them even six months to perform the new legal year ceremony because they don't have the funds to spend five million or ten million or fifty million to perform a simple thing as new legal year. Now so what happens is that because the governors are in total control, they give them this money as dash, you know, fund them as they as they wish. The, the judges have to continue running around them. And in some cases, even the individual judges have to uh, come to the judge, governors for to beg them for one uh, support or the other. Now when it comes to the appointment process, if the state needs to appoint five judges. The governors, through their appointees in, in the State Judicial Service Commission, will provide a list of those five people, or at least four, for that process. So a, a list is predetermined by the governor who gets appointed. The analysis is what is used to present uh, what the agency requires. The agency requires if you are going to appoint 10, you need to provide us 10, um, five, you need to provide us 10 names. One. Uh, two for one post, two for one post, so that there will be uh, some kind of reserve list. Now, the, if there, are, if you provide that reserve list, in many states, the governors will give the NJ, the Judicial Service Commission of the state, eight names for that appointment, and leave one or two for the gov the, uh, the the chief judge to, to to use as his own quota. So the list is predetermined. The positioning of the, uh, you know, the how it is positioned, because if you go to the NJC, uh, there's a priority on the list. Number one, it's more likely to get appointed before any other one. So you also have to arrange the list in accordance to what the governor wants, because he knows, he understands that the NJC normally will follow that priority list in recommending to him, except in, in where there's a major problem. And recently, there have been some attempts by the NJC to, to show some muscle by rearranging the list based on the interviews they conduct at the NJC. Well, generally, the list provided by the governor is what the State Judicial Service Commission is going to provide the NJC as the advice. And it's what the NJC generally has to return to the governor as the advice. And it's what the governor will appoint. If the list changes, the Chief judge, in many cases, is going to have problem with getting funds for that for that period. So, and, and uh, remember, they are getting their pensions through the state. Chief judges, some chief judges, and I know personally, have not been paid for two years, three years. Their pension, they they keep they go hand in hand uh, uh, with the cap, begging people for to support them, to support their eating, their survival. They don't have any cover for a month. Chief judges, and so if you are going a chief judge and you are you know what you are. Uh, predecessor is suffering. You'll be afraid of retiring without any funding. And so, some governors will decide, for example, uh, instead of you, because that pension will not come. Uh, so, when you are retiring, they provide you some fund under their security vote and dash this uh, chief judges that have performed well, has a good relationship with them, uh, especially when they are weak in allowing them to control them. So, they use the funding, that capital project, and the other funding as the, the, the stick, the, to, to control the state. It's a total control. So uh, the, 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 what the, the problem with the 
the, 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 that budgeting is that, the, that funding is that the state ought to budget it in their, uh, put it in their budget and approve it. And there's no way you can tell state A to budget the same thing for state B. And of course, the, the, usually in one state, we not have the same problem generally all the time with, with, the, with this another, uh, judiciary in another state. So the control is that budget and the release of the fund. The money is not released to them. And even when the state is, is so-called states, some so-called states are doing well for the judiciary, they are in total control of that funding. Go meet the, the chief judges. You see how the chief judges tremble at the, at the sight of the voice of the governor. Uh, because the governor is controlling the entire process of the funding process, even when they're supposed to be doing well, good courts, good cars, and all that, uh, travel abroad for medicals and so on, but the governor is in charge. So the, that's the hopelessness of the situation, that the law is there, the constitution is there, the courts are there, but we have refused as human beings to perform our own duties and responsibilities as the leaders of the country. And, and, and it's, it's a very sad development. I would have expected that case that went to the court, the Supreme Court, I would have expected one or two judges, uh, governors to say, no, I'm not going to be part of this. I am going to, I am going to strive and now implement this process. It's not going to challenge uh, the, 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 the federal government and uh, make a, a nonsense of our, of our, of our democracy. Professor Ernesto Joko, yeah. thank, uh, Professor Ernesto Joko, thank you very much there for your explanation. Uh, we had, in fact, discussed Executive Order 10 sometime last year, and the Attorney General of the Federation and some other guys did say that uh, they were having implementation conversations. One of the governors, uh, I think the governor of Plateau State, was also our guest on that occasion, and uh, the whole idea was fine. It, it, they were trying to find a middle ground uh, for the proper implementation of Executive Order 10. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think all of these issues around uh, the powers and, and then the finances uh, were matters uh, to deal with. But uh, you know, so stars, uh, let us see the advocate uh, with us uh, in, in Kaduna. There are a, a number of uh, issues, but the main chunk is that in terms of uh, the financial independence of the judiciary, the Constitution already makes provisions for the salaries, allowances, and emoluments of judicial officers. So state governors have no control over that. But it is in the area of recurrent expenditure, recurrent, <clears throat> excuse me, and those, there are a number of items in that recurrent, whether you are going for training, uh, you're going for travels, and all, even stationary, and so on and so forth, that the uh, chief judge uh, who is up or is nominee will have to go with a file and then sit out uh, along with other guests, you know, awaiting the governor to ask him to come before the governor uh, signs. That's one area. The other area, of course, has to do with capital projects. You know, what kind of uh, projects do you do? And uh, you know, capital projects are not just buildings and so on and so forth. Uh, they could also be a, a broad range of, of, of items. The Constitution already envisaged the likelihood of abuse uh, and therefore the imperial status of, of governors by making that provision in section 121 subsection 3 that look, a state like the federal has a consolidated revenue fund and whatever credit there is to the judiciary should be transmitted to the head of that court so that all these issues around control over recurrent expenditure and capital expenditure will not arise because the salary and emoluments aspects is already taken care of. But the Supreme Court appears to say, well, the practice is governors are in charge, let them continue to be in charge. How do we, how do we get around this if the clear letter of the law is not being respected uh, by state governors? very much. I had said earlier on, and when you read the dissenting judgment on Honorable Justice Abba Aji, I think it solves the practical problem, how to get around this. And it, it, you see, the governors are not wise. They show themselves on the foot by even going to the Supreme Court. Now, they, you, you want control. And, and you say the federal government should uh, 
pay the capital projects and so on, and then you control it. It's just like a baby sucking the mother's breast. Say, yes, uh, feed me, and then I'll still beat you. <laughs> and, and then, unfortunately for them, it, it's, yeah, they, they, to me, it, it, it's not a, a win situation for the states at all. Because the Supreme Court now said, okay, now, yes, the executive order 10 has been struck down, but then you, you are the one to fund your capital projects for, for, uh, for your judiciaries. This is what they were trying to, to run away from. They want control, but they, they don't want to be responsible at all. I'm, I'm not accusing them. Some of them are my friends, but of this sense, some of them don't pick my, my cause because of my advice to them. <laughs> but, you know, it's just like the uh, logic of the alligator. Alligator will say that he doesn't want rain to beat it. And then when the rain is coming, it will run, run back into the river. So <laughs> now they, they have more financial burden by trying to rush to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court they, did not say that financial autonomy is not there. The majority judgment didn't say so. It says, look, because of uh, separation of powers between the federal government and the state, uh, state government, the executive on, on order 10 will not be in tune with the constitution. But then it was made in absolute good faith because the, the governors uh, have totally refused to obey the constitutional provisions and they have no state legislative, competent state legislative houses to compel them to do so. Because as of now, like the judiciary in the states, the state legislative houses are even the worst. They are totally under the control of the governors. In fact, the governors dictate what resolutions they should, be, they, they should pass. And so, there is nobody to question them. In, in a, a, a normal situation, in a law abiding, uh, abiding state, which, which, which we do not have in this country, quote me anywhere. You see, these things, the, the breach, the failure to give the uh, heads of courts they are money M block, and I mean M block, and that's where the control comes from. M block is a breach of the condition, and so it's an impeachable offense. But who are to do so? The bodies to do so are the state legislators. But <coughs> no state legislator to, uh, legislation uh, legislature today can do that. And, and that is why the, the governors are the governors, the chief executive, the uh, head of the legislative houses, and practical heads of courts. If, if, if the legislative houses were independent, we won't talk of these uh, practical problems. They will just say, if you don't do so, we will impeach you. But in, in fact, apart from the fact that the, their elections were ma uh, manufactured and, and, and uh, is, is, it is the candidates of the governor's ward that were elected, not elected, those elected, but, but they call it a, a, a election. So the, the, this is really the, the issue, but I'm even happier about that decision because it says, okay, now you want control. If you want control, then you, you, should, you, you should fund the, 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 the other aspect of, of, of their budget. And I'm sure they're not happy now. But, but you see, like I was saying earlier, one of the ways of this control, again, if, if even the welfare, something like uh, housing allowances and, and so on, do you know how some states, uh, particularly not as state governors, not as state governors do it, where the housing al uh, allowance is supposed to be 200,000, they now give 30. Yes. If, if, you have, you have no somewhere to, if, if you have nowhere to, 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 to sleep, you, you don't have this. Of course, you will be bound by whatever the governor wants you to do. This is how this control is done. It's not that they, they go there and say, do this. So, eh, 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 and they say, ah, well, we know your, your financial uh, issues can only be solved by us. Solved by us, not with our money, but with the monies that are meant to be given to the heads of court directly. And that is why they give it piecemeal. And that's why we are in this problem today. And then, I'm sorry, this issue of uh, um, appointment of judges, the appointment itself doesn't bother me really. Because, you see, even if it is your son that you appoint a position today, the moment he's there, you can no longer control him. Once he's on seat, once he's on seat, you can't control him. It is before then that they have this con uh, total control of trying to get wh whoever is there. And 
the, the NJC who send in names, the governor will say, I don't want to appoint that. And at the end of it, the governor will have his day because NJC will just be begging. That is, that is how in practice, that is how they control. Let's, let's put you on hold. We've uh, gone way past our... All right, welcome back to the program. And let's quickly continue our conversation. Uh, D Damien, the, the decision of the uh, Supreme Court, you know, is infallible. I mean, the executive order has been, you know, squashed. It's, it's, it's no longer in contention. But, but the, the state governors have not said they would not, you know, uh, comply with the provisions of the Constitution with regards to autonomy. In fact, some of them have said they have gone ahead to, you know, implement or put up structures uh, and, and all that. But what does it mean without the first-line charge deductions? First, let me just begin with uh, the first thing we need to know. Even, in fact, everybody knows executive order number 10 without even knowing the full citation of that order. Mm. It was implementation of financial autonomy of state legislature and state judiciary order of 2020. That is the real name of that order. And that order, the name is not unconstitutional per se. The order has been, we cannot fault the, the majority judgment of the Supreme Court. It has said the president overstepped his boundary. Not that. That then nullified the order. But for us that participated in this case, we still believe it's a win for us. We still believe the executive order of the president actually spore out, brought out something positive, no matter its nullification. First, there was a judgment of the federal high court sometime that Jusun dragged the state governors and the attorney generals to court in the federal high court and got a judgment on this issue. So that judgment still subsists. And now, there's a clear pronouncement of the Supreme Court that it is your responsibility to take care of this order financing of the judiciary. So if any court is dilapidated or not functional, the governor will know that it is the Supreme Court has said it is your responsibility. So you failed if the court is not. There. So we believe. And see, we believe, and I believe uh, Nigerians will be happy to know that the president took a step. And even though the Supreme Court said, no, you are not supposed to go further than this. But the president acted in good faith, considering the fact that under Section 5 of the Constitution, he has been given the power to enforce the Constitution for the entire federation or any part. And let us say that the... Before now, it was only the judiciary that were pro pronouncements, the section 2, 1 to 1, captured then only the state judiciary. But with the fourth alteration of the constitution, which is an act of the National Assembly, which the president has the power to enforce, brought in the issue of state legislature. So the president acted, considering the fact that the, uh, the, the, the law enacted by the National Assembly gave him the power to enforce it. We are not faulting the majority judgment of the Supreme Court. As I said earlier, we believe it's a win situation as it is today. We don't, we, there's, uh, uh, for us. So it gives, it gives you room to hold the state governors accountable. Is accountable. That what you, they, 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 you know, the, 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 the legislature, as the, the Leonard Sick said earlier, should have been the body responsible for checking the powers of the governor. You are not doing the right thing by not sending this money directly to. However, yes, I, I'm sorry to say, but they've been reduced to. Uh, there's there's, there's, yeah, there's yeah, an interference. But, but, but that's, that's precisely where the problem lies. And these are the practical challenges that have been highlighted. That, yeah, the Supreme Court has said, look, uh, the president uh, uh, had an overreach in seeking to implement that provision of the Constitution. Constitution. But there was no, I, I, I've not read the full judgment, yes, I must sir. admit, because yes. the full judgment is not available just yet. Yes. But the, the Supreme Court, their, their lordships did not then say what the consequences would be for anyone that fails to implement the Section 121, Subsection 3, for instance. Because if the subterfuge of, uh, of uh, their excellencies continues, then what happens? 
As I said earlier, <laughs> you know, <laughs> before now, the, the discussion on judicial independence was also out there, but there was nothing, no attempt before now to enforce this particular. Somebody, the president, has take, uh, uh, took a bold step to try to enforce that. Okay. And I think yeah, it but has but brought... That step, that Could step. we have done it, uh, uh, I mean, in another way? There you mean the president? Been, yes. To direct the states? Could, yes, to enforce... No, there's no other way he could have done it that I know of. But let me just agree with uh, my colleague here that it's a win-win situation, uh, irrespective of the outcome of the case. It has opened the eyes of everybody. It has exposed the state governments and put them in the public eye uh, that you are not implementing section one to one subsection three of the constitution. As to consequences, I think King's the one who asked, there are, there are supposed to be consequences mm -hmm. for flouting or violating any provision of the constitution or any law. And Valid, as was said validly before, made. validly made. That is an impeachable offense. But who we implement it is the state legislature that is perhaps even a weaker position than even the state judiciary. Um, in terms of looking at the way forward, as I said before, this has exposed a major problem in, the, in our practice of democracy and constitutionalism. How do we overcome this? We are talking of Section 121, Financial Autonomy of the States, but Nigerians are already familiar with the breach of the provision relating to state independent electoral commissions, elections into local government councils. Every, every Nigerian knows now that that is a big issue. That virtually all these state governments, the, the state independent electoral commissions don't enjoy any independence. Hardly, hardly do they. Uh, one of, perhaps, an exception, the recent elections in Kaduna State where the governor or the state independent electoral commission actually returned uh, uh, people who won, who ran under the platform of political party other than the governor's political party. But in most cases, in most cases, all the councillors and all the chairmen are, uh, of the governor's party become elected. You can see that something is wrong there. Mm -hmm. And because of this, many people clamor that INEC, the federal one, should be responsible for the conduct of local government council elections. Is that really a solution? Because local governments should be under the states. Why can't the states, what should Nigerians be doing to ensure that states perform their roles properly under the constitution? The federal, at the federal level is relatively better. Things work better. Performance of oversight functions at the federal level is much better than at the state level. The electoral body at the federal level is much better than the one at the funding of the judicial, federal judiciary is much better than at the state level. Why can't the states begin to emulate or people in the state challenge their states to rise up to the standard at the federal level? Very that is, val yeah, yes. very valid issues you have raised, bro. We're getting pressed for time. I, I want to uh, throw in this other issue uh, about the consequences of the control and therefore emasculation of the state judiciaries. Uh, in, in jurisprudence, this is re the realism school. The Scandinavians and the Americans have different uh, perspectives. But in practical terms, Professor Ojuku, if you are still there uh, with us uh, via Zoom, when we say control and emasculation, on Good Morning Nigeria, we have uh, discussed issues around, for instance, consequences for uh, election-related violence. And these are usually offenses under the current uh, stat uh, statutes, triable uh, by uh, state courts. And so when you have the judiciary uh, of the state under the control of the executive, some persons would argue that this is the reason uh, why violent thugs you know, who belong to the, uh, uh, or who are working for the party in the control of the state never get punished for election-related violence. And at the end of the day, uh, justice suffers where, for instance, the state government or the state governor 
uh, with greater respect to them, where they have an interest uh, in a particular matter. How do we get around this, Professor Ojuku, quickly? Yeah, I, I, I'm a, can I be heard? I, I, I think my, the whole idea goes down to a political solution. We have to create awareness among our people. We have to engage, we have to make our people get aware that we be part of the system and engage with our leaders. You know, we, we have left them too long to to uh, continue to do anything like. I mean, the examples of of uh, of uh, of misgovernance is so so great at the state level, so terribly great. And we have had some of them from the annex to local government control to judiciary Hello. control. Yeah. No, it's, 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 we have to create yeah. our okay, I can I can see I can see it now. We have to purposefully okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, 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 Professor Juku, it looks like uh, there's some it, uh, interference. It looks probably you have uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, phones or appliances on and there is interference. While you saw that out, let's go back to uh, Kaduna and get uh, Yunus Ustaz's uh, comment. Uh, uh, Yunus Ustaz, Linen Student Advocate, if you are still there, uh, how do we overcome this practical challenge of actually getting justice uh, even where the state government or state uh, governor has an interest. Say, for instance, election-related violence where people hardly ever get punished. It, it, you see, it, it is the indigents of those states that can, since the legislative houses have failed or are, 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 are just there like uh, dogs that uh, they don't even back, let, let alone to talk of biting. You see, are you saying that in every state we don't have some credible, courageous people who love their own states to, to work as the federal government is doing, let these people go to court and say, impeach the governor. You, you see, they, they are the ones to suffer. It is unfortunate. When somebody says there is no way out, there is a way out. Get the governor, go to court and say, but normally it would be more effective if it is the indigenous of those states who say, I'm a tax-paying person, I'm, I'm an indigen of this state, what the, the, the breach of the condition by the governor is biting us, is affecting us adversely. Go for impeachable offenses. The moment you do so, the governors will sit up. And then, the, at the end of, uh, of it, we should pray that in 2023, we don't have the type of governors we, we have now. And I think... And I think that is the ultimate uh, solution. Because let us just pray that we don't have lawless governors as we have now. And I have no apology at all. Most of them are lawless. It, it's not good. It's not good for any country at all. At all at advocate all. of Nigeria, Yunus Ustaz Usman, uh, we'd really like to appreciate you for your comments. You've joined us uh, from our Kadena uh, studio. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on the program. Let me also appreciate uh, Professor Ernest Ujuku, who is also a senior advocate of Nigeria SAN and the pioneer head Nigeria Law School in Ugo. Uh, always uh, a pleasure to have you on our program, sir. Thank you. Okay, and also uh, I'm afraid I have to appreciate uh, Damian Agbe, who is a Temba, Damian Agbe, Principal State Counsel, Department of Civil Appeals, Federal Ministry of Justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, last but certainly not the least, His Excellency, uh, former Governor of Edo State and Professor of Law, Professor Oserime Osumbo. Thank you very much, sir, Thank for joining us. Thank you very much. Out. All right. And uh, uh, that's it for Good Morning Nigeria today. But just before we go, a quick look at sports.